Well, good morning. We're on chapter 32 of our of the Confession of Faith, and we're going to consider the chapter this morning, and we'll be done with the confession proper, and then next week I do want to discuss. Uh, there are some a little a couple printouts of handout that when we got started about uh, what does it mean to adopt a confession and and uh, what those uh, things mean and how it affects the church and. And so I want to discuss that a little bit next week uh, to consider what does it mean for a church to say these are things that we believe and to hold to them and to teach them. And part of the whole purpose of uh, teaching this uh, confession the way I have is to try to help us have a uh, basic understanding of theology. Uh, to see the, uh, we have to remember the Bible is not a systematic book of theology. Uh, it's fleshed out in the details of people's lives. Uh, we see how Abraham and Noah lived. We see how David lived. We see how Moses lived. We see the apostles. And we, have, we do have a body of doctrine uh, proper, so to speak, from Romans to Philemon. Uh, but there's not a, you don't just lump in the Bible and say, okay, I'm going to read everything that God has had to say about his character in one place. Uh, the work of systematic theology is man trying to take all the information that God has given to him and to arrange in a way, uh, I use the word topical here and the idea of systematically, uh, that it's easy for us to grab a hold of. We can go and say, okay, this is what God has said about his nature and his attributes, his character. This is what God has said about justification, about sanctification. And that's a help to us. Uh, because then we can go through those threads of Scripture uh, as we from one end to the other and see how the whole fits together. Uh, and so there's a, I know in our day and age, there's a decry against systematic theology and there's also a cry against, uh, as our confession here is done with using what they call proof texts. We take this verse and put a bunch of verses together and say this is what the Bible teaches on doctrine. And, and what they want us to do is say, well, you've got to study the entire Bible, which you have to, in order for you to understand theology. And that's, that's it. You, can't, you have to take a whole, whole book. You can't put doctrines together that way. <laughs> one of the great English theologians, uh, of course, John Owen's probably the greatest one. The next one, in my opinion, is John Gill. He, did, he wrote a nine-volume commentary on the Bible, and when he got done with that, he said, what next? And he said, why don't we do theology? So a man who wrote a commentary on the whole Bible then sat down and did a, a study of theology. So he was quite equipped to do that. He was uh, appropriate to do that. So I do recommend John Gill. Uh, it's a uh, good reading, and what he uh, did in his systematic theology was that wasn't just him writing theology for theology's sake, but he actually preached those messages to his people. Uh, so when you read it, there is a, it comes across pastorally, it comes across that, hey, he is writing to somebody. It's not just words on paper, killing trees for no reason. And uh, there's too many of those books that are out there. So we come to chapter 32 this morning. Uh, I say all that, just kind of a digression. We'll have to shoot that rabbit, I guess, but uh, to say that the men who put the Westminster Confession together initially, that would become the pattern for the, the Second London Baptist Confession, were deep men of theological conviction and understanding. Uh, and the proof that uh, what they had to say is held up against scrutiny is the fact that people are still using this confession uh, 350 years later. Uh, and like we're using the King James Bible, it's over 400 years old now. It's, it has stood the test of time. And when we look at our world, what, what is considered of value? Things that stand the test of time. We think about, you could say about the pyramids in Egypt. You could say about Stonehenge. You could talk about different uh, architectural type of endeavors. And we could say... There's some value in it. It's been around for centuries, for millennia. There's weight given to that. And there should be weight and consideration given to uh, things that have stood the test of time of scrutiny. Uh, because the Bible, first of all, everything that we know comes from Scripture. 
And everything that we study or believe must be verified against Scripture. And so if I would say that if there's anything wrong in the confession, then it must be wrong because it's wrong with the Bible. And, uh, and so we want to be careful that, first of all, again, the confession is not the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. And the confession is more of a, a guidebook. Like if you go to a site, like a museum or something, and you go in the uh, guest shop where everything's like overpriced because it's the guest it's the store inside the museum. And what do they have sometimes? They have little guidebooks. You can buy and you can take that guidebook and it, ta- you know, it talks about everything that's you know, about the painting on the wall and, and you, know, you got pictures because they don't want you taking pit flash photography because it degrades the picture paintings and things like that. And, and you can have a guidebook to go through the museum. Well, the way I look at a confession of faith is it's a guidebook. It's to help us navigate the Word of God, to okay. consider those things in its totality. And so here we have in chapter 32, and read Acts chapter 17 and verse uh, 31. We'll read a few verses and we'll read our first paragraph. Again, we're talking about of the last judgment. This is the idea of cosmic uh, eschatology. We've already looked at several things in the last two times that we met to uh, lay a foundation for an understanding of the different uh, thought processes that are out there uh, on the end times events, but also to delineate our position a little clearer. In chapter 17, verse 31 of Acts, the scripture says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him uh, from the dead. In John chapter 5 and verse 22, John chapter 5 and verse 22, and again, we'll probably have to uh, omit a few verses this morning just for the sake of time. But John chapter 5 and verse 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but committed all judgment unto the Son. And in verse 27, And given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 3, Know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? The little epistle of Jude and verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation have reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great, of the great day. And then let's uh, go over to uh, Romans chapter 14 and verse 10 and 12. Romans 14, 10 and 12. Why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, And verse 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account to himself to God, or give account of himself to God. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And uh, beginning in verse 32, we find the scriptures that uh, the Lord speaking, he said, before him shall be gathered all nations, he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then if you skip down to verse uh, 39, Or when we saw thee sick or in prison and came unto thee, the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, Ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels, for I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat, I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. And so our paragraph here this morning says, God hath appointed a day wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ, 
whom all power and judgment is given of the Father, in which day not only the apostate angels shall be judged, but likewise all persons that have lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ to give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds, and receive according that they have done in the body, whether good or evil. And so we could title the paragraph here, the, the Divinely Appointed Day, and God has appointed a day of judgment. Now, I want to mention here uh, about the time of judgment. In the Westminster Confession of Faith and the London Baptist Confession of Faith, they read identically. However, as I was studying for, on this issue now for several years, trying to nail down and sort some things out, run across some, a denomination called Bible Presbyterianism or Bible Presbyterian. And they had, uh, in 1938, they had adapted uh, the Westminster Confession to reflect a preacher premillennial position. So while, you know, we're talking 1938 and this is 2024, so we're talking about almost 100 years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, they had adopted that or, or amended their, con their confession uh, to allow for a preacher premillennial uh, rapture and the literal thousand years. And, and they just simply inserted this statement. So if you notice in your confession, it says, Our God has appointed a day wherein, uh, or appointed a day. And then they put in, if you notice on your outline, there's a parenthesis there. It says, Which word in Scripture, in reference to the last things, may represent a period of time including the thousand years following the visible personal premillennial return of Christ? And then they, that's the end of their little inclusion. And then they put, and then followed by the rest of the paragraph. And uh, so that's how uh, they amended their confession to reflect a pre-tribulational and pre-millennial return. The Lord Jesus Christ with that thousand year literal kingdom. And also the fact that uh, it recognizes that when we talk about the day of the Lord, that's not just a singular 24-hour day but it's the and it's the whole uh program that the lord jesus christ has considering the end time events uh, so that's how they amended that and i was rather impressed with the way they did that and not messed with anything else in the confession uh, and so as that's why i spent so much time the last two lectures trying to explain you know, what are these different positions and how they work and what they are uh, to explain that uh, this is doable and that it doesn't mess with anything else because the problem when you have, when you, when you look at theology, uh, and this is, a, this is a human problem, is we study something and we go, oh, that sounds interesting or there, and unintentionally we may pull a thread somewhere else, like on a, a garment or a rug or something, you know, on a carpet, you know, you run the vacuum cleaner by and it snags the rug and it jerks some string way down over somewhere else. Well, if you're not careful in, study, in the study of theology, you can do that unintentionally. Now, there's some people who do it intentionally, but I'm going on good faith that we're not, we're trying to be good, careful students of God's Word. So we have to be careful that when we meddle with things that we're not doing something else somewhere else that's going to uh, lead into heresy or some other problem and so that's why i said i would studied that issue for quite a while before i came to the conclusion that this is proper we can do this and not mess with something else because the dispensationalism is a system of theology we've talked about dispensationalism and, and there's a consistent application of dispensationalism. Everything ends in failure. And the reason the Lord Jesus Christ is coming is because the church has failed. And my position is that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming not because the church has failed, but, but because the church is successful, because the Lord himself is successful. All those who are elect who will be saved will be saved before the rapture happens. All those that are supposed to be saved prior to the rapture will be saved. None of them will be lost. And that seven year period is God pouring out his wrath and his judgment on this world because of their rebellion and their rejection of Christ. And it's what God uses to bring the nation of Israel to repentance. And he comes and sets up his millennial kingdom. 
And so we talk about this day of judgment. There's several things that are related to it. That of, uh, we find in our paragraph again, uh, that the day of judgment is according to righteousness. And it says there, to whom all power and judgment, or, I'm sorry, let me, I got it ahead of there. It says, God has appointed a day wherein he shall judge the world and righteousness by Jesus Christ. This world is going to be judged. And, you know, I've met people, tried to share the gospel with them, and they say, I'm good. I don't need all that. But one day they will stand before God. And I'm thankful that the Lord came by my way where I was at because I'd be just like that other person going, no, I'm good, I don't need God. Because that's man in his natural rebellious state. So it's going to be a judgment according to righteousness. And what is that righteousness? It's Christ. God is the holy and righteous one. But also the day of judgment is by Jesus Christ. Uh, in John 5, 22, it talks about that all judgment has been given to the Son. Why? Because uh, now God the Father and God the Son are equal. And because God the Father and God the Son are equal, there can only be one divine will. This is really important for our understanding. There can only be one divine will. So when God the Son says, I came to do the will of God the Father, he has to, or else there's going to be schism in the Godhead. And now you have two supreme beings operating independently of each other. Mm. And what happens when man operates independently of God? He sins. And so Christ the Son must do that which the Father has said to do. But why is it then that the Father gives all judgment to the Son? Because it's the Son who was sent to die on the cross of Calvary, that He's the one who is despised and rejected of men. Right. And so it only be right for the Son who died in our place, who was despised and rejected by mankind, to judge those who despised and rejected Him. So in Ananias, Ananias the high priest, he stood before Christ that he had crucified. Amen. Pontius Pilate stood before Christ whom he ordered crucified. And there's a, a, a sense of justice in that to, for a, the one who has been wronged to be able to face the one who wronged them and to have a proper justice for that. But now also we find the subjects of the, on the day of judgment in which they not only the apostate angels should be judged, but likewise all persons have, that have lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ. So all apostate angels, mm -hmm. all those who are uh, in hell, uh, already bound, those who are free and loose, Satan will stand there. I'm looking forward to that day, as described in Isaiah, where Satan's bound hand and foot being ready to be kicked off into uh, the lake of fire and brimstone for all eternity. And we get to walk by going, this is him. This is the one that gave us all this trouble. This is the one who weakens the nations. This is him? Well, I'm not saying that in this, not in this body. I'm not saying that on this side of eternity, that's for sure. But I am looking forward to that day where we will be able to walk by and say that about Satan. Amen. Uh, but also all persons. Where's the point on the man wants to die and after this the judgment, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. But also the activity of the day of judgment, the subjects will give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds. Nothing escapes the judgment of Christ. But also the subjects receive their just reward. Notice the last little clause there, and to receive according to that which they have done in the body, whether good or evil. And so that Christ is righteous in his judgment of those things. But then we find in the second paragraph the purpose of this day. And if you look with me in Romans chapter 9 and uh, verse 22 and 23. Romans chapter 9 verse 22 and 23, what if God willing to show his wrath to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction or fitted to destruction 
and that he might make known the riches of his glory on, on the vessels of mercy which he had before prepared unto glory. Matthew chapter 25. In verse 21. Matthew 25 and verse 21. His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. Thou will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And then verse uh, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter, well while we're here, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And then 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4 and verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not, and not to me only, but unto all them that also that love his appearing. And uh, Mark chapter 9 and verse 48. Mark chapter 9. And verse 48. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7 through 10. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only who only he who now letteth will let. Now I know that in the modern and religious industrial complex they have a fit about this verse in the king james bible but uh, the word let means to allow uh, when we we say uh i'll let you do that we're just saying i allow you to do that and and they make they've killed they've murdered whole forests of trees complaining about this verse uh, i don't know why you know, it seems pretty plain to the context to me that that's what the word means is to allow. And that's what it does mean. And you're welcome to check the dictionary. Uh, there's, uh, the truth always stands up against scrutiny. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness to them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. Mm -hmm. And so, what we find in our paragraph then, the end of God's appointed, the end of God's appointing this day is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy and the eternal salvation of the elect and of his justice and the eternal damnation of the reprobate who are wicked and disobedient for then shall the righteous go into everlasting life and receive that fullness of joy and glory with everlasting rewards in the presence of the Lord but the wicked who know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ should be cast aside into everlasting torments and punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the, from the glory of His power. So what is the purpose of the day of judgment? First of all, it's the manifestation of His glory and justice. It's the, in the eternal salvation of the elect, those who He said He loved from the foundation of the world, those promises are kept and they enter into eternal rest with the Lord. But also it's an eternal damnation uh, they're reprobate. Uh, first of all, their condition is they're wicked. Uh, we look at the world around us, and even as John said in his epistle, his first epistle, the whole world lieth in wickedness. Yeah. Everything that sin has touched is ruined. Yeah. It's just the reality. Uh, we live in a sin-cursed, sin-fallen world, and the wicked uh, enjoy it. But their acts, they are also disobedient mm -hmm. 
You know, when you, when you think about wickedness and disobedience, all right, we can pass laws that deter wickedness. But the problem is, what happens is the wicked person is disobedient to the law. Now, it may restrain some wickedness, but the problem is they're still wicked. If they had opportunity to act upon their wickedness, they would do so. And that's the problem with human nature is that our depraved nature is that while not every man acts totally in accordance with his depravity, and we can thank the Lord for that, yet there is a reality that if man is allowed to, he will act that way. We could use the big names of history. Genghis Khan, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, Adolf Hitler, you know, uh, Chairman Mao. I mean, we could just name them after despot after despot who have murdered millions and millions of people. But we can be thankful that not that there is a restraining power. He that letteth will let, and uh, and so the Holy Spirit does restrain those things. But there is a day of judgment. Uh, for those that are wicked and disobedient. But there's also a blessing upon the elect. Notice they shall receive everlasting life. By the way, when does everlasting life begin? Eternal life begin? The moment someone's converted. That's when your everlasting life begins. But in that day of judgment, it's finalized. It's, it's, it's brought to... That reality that already is, is brought to pass. Amen. Also, we find that uh, there's a fullness of joy. <coughs> We're going to have perfect minds, perfect bodies. And when I mean perfect, I'm not talking about as in being perfect like the Lord Jesus Christ. What I mean is that it's, there's without spot, there's no blemish. We're right in our thinking, we're right in our practice. Or we are now divested of our sin nature. Uh, that's been thoroughly cleansed and replaced and fixed. It's been, and now we can enter truly in the fullness of joy, be in the presence of God. We can enjoy the glory of God. What does it mean for glory? Well, we, when we think of glory, we praise God because why well, he's the highest being that there is. He's the only one worthy of all our praise and glory. But what does it mean to be glorified with Christ? Well, Jesus said, I always do that which pleases the Father. And what did the Father say? I am well pleased. And what is it that we're told that our goal is that when we enter into heaven to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To be glorified with Christ is to enter in that idea, at least in one aspect, of that we are receiving the same commendation that Christ has received. He did well, and we have done well. And in that we are also, there's glory to be had in that, not of our own praise, but in thanksgiving to God for his grace to us. And then everlasting reward in the presence of God. But then there's also the damnation of the wicked. What is their character? They know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I go back to chapter 20 about the gospel. In order for them to know who God is, to know the Lord Jesus Christ, they have to hear the gospel. Yeah. But what does it mean to not know God? It means they did not know Him as He is revealed in the pages of Scripture. God has given it to every man to know that God is, but yet man rejects that knowledge. They refuse it. And so they know not God. They do not know God. They don't have a relationship with God. They don't obey the gospel. But then there's an act of judgment upon them. Just as there's a blessing upon the elect, there's an act of judgment upon the reprobate. They should be cast into everlasting torments. As we read there where the fire burneth and the worm and the worm dieth not. The fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Wicked man is not annihilated. There's, there is some people who believe that uh, only the, those who are born again, they'll receive life. And those who are wicked, they just cease to exist. They're annihilated. Uh, and the reality is, no, the soul is never annihilated. When the soul was born in this world, it is eternal. The question is, to where is it going? Is it going to go to eternal life with the Lord in heaven? Or is it going into eternal damnation with the wicked in hell for all eternity? The soul is going somewhere. 
It's not going to just cease to exist. But also they shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Again, the soul is never destroyed, but it's punished with everlasting destruction. Just wave upon wave and punishment of for all eternity. Uh, they should be cast out of the presence of the Lord. Now, when you talk to an atheist, and, and you begin sharing the gospel. And what do they do? I don't know God. I don't want to know God. I, I, I want God out of this world. I want God out of our country. I want God out of society. I want God. You know, there's no room for God. And you realize what God has done for them. He's answered their request. They don't want the very presence of God. They don't want his effect in their life. They don't want his grace and his mercy. And so they get none of it. In this life, even the avowed atheists and the wicked still receive the sunshine, still receive the rain, still receive the blessings that God has on this earth for all his creatures. But there is no blessing in hell. There's no comfort there. But also they shall know, they shall not know the glory of his power. They won't under, they'll never understand the mercy and the grace of God. Amen. All those who are in heaven will be rejoicing over the grace and the mercy of God His power to bring to pass all that He has promised. But those in hell will not be able to do those things. And so they'll be cast out from the very presence of the Lord and from His glory and His power. And in paragraph 3, we see Christ's purpose uh, for this day. And let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 10 and 11. Well, while we got your place here in 2 Thessalonians, let's go ahead and read verse uh, 5 and 6 uh, and 7. Again, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and know ye not what withholdeth that he might reveal in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 10 and 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also that are made manifest in your consciences. And then Mark chapter 13 Mark chapter 13, verse 35, down through verse 37. Mark chapter 13, and verse 35. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or, in the, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Now I want you to notice something there. Uh, it just kind of sticks out to me now that I have chickens. Notice there's four times given. The even at midnight at the cock crowing or in the morning. Roosters just crow whenever they want to. You know, three o'clock in the morning. Peter found out they crow at three o'clock in the morning. You know, they, they do their own thing. And so I just thought it was interesting that the Holy Spirit says also the cock crowing. Whenever the rooster wants to crow, that might be the Lord's coming. Uh, verse uh, 36, less... Uh, I uh, less coming suddenly he find you sleeping and what I say unto you I say unto all watch and then Luke chapter 12 12 and 35 lest your loins be girded about and your lights be burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, that may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching, verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve him. And he shall come in the second, and if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants, and this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. 
Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20. He which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. And so this last paragraph, Christ's purpose for this day. Our paragraph reads, As Christ would have us to be certainly persuaded that there shall be a day of judgment, both to deter all men from sin for the, and for the greater consolation of the godly in their adversity, so we have a day unknown to men that they may shake off all carnal security and be always watchful because they know not at what hour the Lord will come and may ever be prepared to say, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Amen. So we find in this paragraph is that we should be certainly persuaded that the day of judgment is coming. It's only by God's grace that we are in 2024. Amen. Now, the world says this statement. They say, what's well, 2024? I can't believe that this is the thing, you know, whatever the thing in is going on. And the basis why they say that is because they believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. They believe that as time goes on, man is getting better and smarter and whatever. And so the things of the past that were man was dumb and ignorant should be fixed by now. Well, the reality is this, that's not the truth. Uh, man is still man. Hasn't yeah. changed a bit. Yeah. And so when we look at 2024, and by the way, it's A.D. in the Anno Domini, which is the year of the Lord, we say that by, by God's grace, God has allowed us 2,024 years since Christ's birth. Amen. And He hasn't sent His judgment yet, but yet judgment is coming. There's still space as long as, the, as long as Christ hasn't returned and you're still alive and drawing breath for you to repent. And so the day, so we should be persuaded that day of judgment is coming. Why? Because well, to deter men from sin. That we know that a day of judgment is coming. So as 1 John 3 and verse 3 says that uh, he that have this hope purifieth himself even as he is pure. Why? Because we know there's a day that's coming but also for the consolation of the godly and their adversity. The Lord told us there's going to be trials and tribulations in this life, in this world. And the judgment of Christ, the day of his judgment, gives us comfort. Knowing that, that, that not everything in this world has to be handled in this lifetime. Amen. That justice doesn't always have to be now. Now, obviously, we want justice now. We want things that have been done wrongly fixed, if possible. But there's some things uh, that can't be. And only God can judge them. And so even in our own life, when we deal with people and they wrong us and they refuse to make it right, all we can do is give that to the Lord, knowing that there's a day of judgment coming. That God will sort all those things out at the judgment seat. Amen. And it'll be a perfect judgment, a righteous judgment. And so for us as God's children, that should be a comfort to us Amen. in our adversity, knowing that that's coming. But also, well, we, we do not know the time of the day of judgment. And so that way we can shake off carnal security. Could you, uh, if you'll use your sanctified imagination for a moment, and let's say that the Lord is coming on September 21st, that's the fall equinox, is that correct? Well, September 21st or September 23rd? The 21st. And let's say it's 2026 and the Lord's going to come. I'm not setting a date. Okay, I'm just using this as an illustration. Now let's say that it was in the Word of God that the Lord's coming September 21st of 2026. The reason why I use September 21st because Harold Camping every year said that the Lord was coming on September 21st. He was a false prophet, a false teacher. But I say that because, so, let's say you're born in, you know, let's say that was, because that's part of the scripture, it's written in, you know, 8090. 
Lord's coming back September 21st, 2026. And you're born in, say, 105 AD. And you say, you know what? The Lord's not returning. There's not going to be any judgment until 2026. That's 1,900 years away. So what are they going to do? They're going to live their life however they want to up until the moment they think they're going to die. Because they, they know the judgment's way off. There's a carnal security in that. The man would say, I'm good. Judgment ain't coming yet. I can do whatever I want to. I can wait till the 11th hour. Right till before I die, I can confess to the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. Well, the problem is that's not how salvation works to start with. Uh, he who waits the 11th hour finds it comes at 1030, I think is the popular proverb. And so man would use that as carnal security. But because we don't know when he's coming, then there's no room to say, I have time. As Paul said, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, because we're not guaranteed any of that. The Lord may come today, even maybe this very hour. We don't know. And so it shakes off carnal security, but it's to be always watchful because we don't know the hour of his return. We don't know when he's coming. And so we ought to be faithful and be ready and waiting for him to come. And at the end, as in Revelation 22 and verse 20 says, he which testified these things saith, surely I come quickly. That's the Lord Jesus Christ saying that. The Lord said that. You know, I find it interesting if you hold your place here and you go to Genesis chapter 1. And you go to verse 3, and what do you find? And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning, we have God speaking. At the very end, we have Christ speaking. Now, obviously, all of it is God's inspired word. What I'm saying is we have recorded actual what God said verbally. He said, and the Lord says, surely I come quickly. It's been 1900 years. Let's see, 20. If the Lord was crucified in 33, just use the, uh, I believe it was closer to 30. But if he is crucified in 33. This is 2024. We're just, you know, if the Lord lets us live long enough and he doesn't return, it will be 2,000 years from the time of Christ's crucifixion on the cross of Calvary. When Christ ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, after that's 50, 50 days after his death, burial, and resurrection, and he, he said, I, I'm coming again. It will be 2,000 years from his first statement of I, I, will, I am coming again. And if we give Revelation uh, a date of, say, 90 AD in 20, 2090, which I won't, I doubt I make that. <laughs> but in 2090, it will be 2,000 years when this was uttered. Surely I come quickly. Now, I'm not trying to attach any significance to numbers of 2,000 years from what is being said and anything regarding to Christ coming other than to say this. We are on the cusp of 2,000 years of saying He's coming. Amen. He's coming. He's coming. And even after we're dead and gone, the truth is still really going to remain. He's coming. Because He said, I come quickly. Even though it's been 2,000 years, but what is time to God? He's eternal. Amen. It was 4,000 years from the time of, of when God made the earth and Adam sinned in the garden to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in theory, if I could put it this way, again, I'm not date setting. It might be 4,000 years till he comes again from the time of his ascension. If we just look at it that way. And I'm not, again, please understand, I'm not setting any dates by any means. All I'm saying is whether he comes 
this very hour, or it comes next year, or it comes a thousand years, or two thousand years from now, it's still the same statement. Behold, I come quickly. And that should give us comfort. And that should give us help. And it should also cause us to want to live our lives in a way that's honoring and pleasing to God because we don't know when He's coming. And yet the message is still the same. I enjoy reading books you know, printed 500 years ago. They say, it, it's been 1,500 years since Christ coming and He's coming again. And, and, and here we are another 500 years later and we can still say, He's coming. Why? Because it's what His words say. It's what He's told us. And so there is a warning and a blessing to mankind. A warning that without the righteousness of Christ, there is a place called hell that they'll spend all eternity. But the blessing is that if we turn to Christ and confess Him and call upon Him for salvation, we have eternal life.